continuing in an attitude of worship, please will you turn to Isaiah 31. There are notes behind me, but I've intentionally put the whole outline of the message on, on one page. Uh, for those of you who would like to have some sort of structure to it, I won't be referencing that outline. I will just be preaching through the text, uh, one verse to the next, and one point, uh, one theme or application to the next. But I'm going to be, in Isaiah 31, we'll read these nine verses, the whole chapter, and then pray, and then we'll begin. Isaiah 31. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is helped will fall, and they will all perish together. For thus the Lord said to me, as a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise, so the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its hill. Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For in that day everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have simply made for you. And the Assyrian shall fall by a sword, but not of man. And a sword not of man shall devour him. And he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, please help us as we turn to your word. Help us to understand, to apply, not to misapply. Help us to hear and not to mishear. Give us wisdom in all things we ask for your name's sake. Amen. The chariot was a weapon that revolutionized warfare in the ancient world. They were fast and lethal. The horses that pulled them could trample over infantry. The wheels and base would have blades that protruded from the side, shattering the limbs of those that they passed by. The platform itself would usually have two charioteers, one to drive and run down the enemy, and the other to fire arrows or hurl spears into their ranks. And the overall effect was one of shock and awe, slicing through the ranks of the enemy or harassing them mercilessly in retreat. An army's strength was often measured in its ability to field chariot divisions, and their skill in the field was much the same measured by this, as much the same as milit militaries today in the, or in the last hundred years have counted dreadnoughts or tanks or aircraft or missiles or most recently drones uh, to measure their power. To have a force of chariots at your disposal was the ability to project your will upon others. And because warfare in the ancient world was often a, a formal affair, lining up and uh, arranging a, a meet date to go and fight, not the stealth and the camouflage of operations today, it was not unheard of for chariots to be decorated elaborately with, with pictures and with color. The overall effect would be to have something as flamboyant as a Ferrari, uh, but with the shock value of a tiger tank blitzing across the battlefield. And the charioteers themselves were a bit like fighter jocks. They were a class unto their own, admired an elite, a cut above all the regular grunts, also they regarded themselves. 
And you can bet that every little boy rushing around with a stick in his hand, using it as a sword, pretending to fight the baddies, wanted to be a chariot driver. To be the one riding that sleek, dashing vehicle, to be surging across the plains with the wind in his hair and laughing in triumph. Now, this was a thing of beauty and speed and even honor. But it was Egypt in particular that became associated with chariots, and they were the, one of the premier superpowers for centuries. In fact, uh, Tutankhamun's tomb even had a number of well-preserved chariots in it, so uh, we, we know what they look like. Nice, shiny chariots, and who wouldn't want one? In the year 1247 B.C., Ramesses II won a famous tactical victory over the Hittites in one of the great chariot battles of history at Kadesh. And all through the Old Testament, over and over again, over 140 times, chariots are mentioned. Joseph rode a chariot like a limo when he was eventually honored in Egypt. And of course, you remember Exodus 17, how Pharaoh sent his chariots to run down and capture the Israelites at the Red Sea, and how they were, were crushed and swept away by the waters uh, as God acted to save them. The Canaanite cities that Joshua fought against fielded many chariots. And in our series on Judges, you would have heard about Sisera and his chariots of iron. King Saul fought against a coalition of Philistines numbering many thousands of chariots. King David hamstrung the chariot horses of his enemies to neutralize their power. King Solomon had over 1,400 chariots whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And when God came for Elijah, he came with chariots of fire. Over and again they are mentioned. And it is with this background in mind, chariot power, chariot diplomacy, that you must begin to, to look at Isaiah 31. It has a context. It's not hard to understand. We're now long past the days of King David, and the nation has split into two, into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And the great threat at this point of history is from the mighty Assyrian Empire. Why? Well, geopolitically, because they were an expansionist empire, they were moving south, and Israel and Judah were much smaller kingdoms right for the picking. But that's just the superficial reason. The real reason, says the Old Testament prophets, is that Assyria was to be a weapon in the Lord's hand how he was using that empire to punish Israel in particular, so many times had that nation been warned to follow him. So often the Lord had been patient with them, and so repeatedly they had turned again to the sins of Jeroboam, to idolatry, despite all the calls of the prophets. And eventually, God said, enough is enough. He stirred up their enemies to encroach upon their, power, their region and to come against them in a series of devastating judgment, using evil to punish evil, using Assyria to punish Israel. And their response, what did Israel do? Did they repent? No, they did not. Uh, they looked to the north, they saw the Assyrian juggernaut coming. They looked to the east and they saw more Assyrian territory and just some hot dusty deserts. They looked to the west, they saw the Mediterranean Sea and there's no help coming from that quarter. But then they looked to the south and they saw Egypt. A traditional enemy to all the empires coming out the north like the Hittites who they defeated at Kadesh. And so Israel's heart, it, it skipped a beat. And their spirits were raised, and their hope rekindled, and they thought to themselves, there lies our salvation. There's the answer. The enemy of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, so let's send a message to Pharaoh. And did I mention how nice and shiny their chariots were? But soon it all fell apart, and in the year 722 B.C., Israel and its capital, Samaria, were utterly ruined. They were conquered and enslaved and exiled to Assyria, and that would seem to be the end of the story for them and the end of the story, but it is not. Because what is utterly amazing is that their cousins in the south, the kingdom of Judah, had the same disposition as Israel did. And they too began to rely on Egypt for deliverance from Assyria. And so God says this to, to Judah, verse 1, Woe! to those who 
go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. I mean, how's this for a slap in the face? The first word is exceptionally strong. Whoa! And even, even the sound of it communicates that, that agony of despair. Woe to you, says the Lord, if you put your trust in Pharaoh's chariots. And, and this wasn't the beginning of the rebuke. We, we kind of just dropped into it midway. In the previous chapter it reads, Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of the, my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation." Now, it seems that they were particularly hard-headed in this matter. That they made plans, but not of God. They made alliances, but not being led by the Spirit. They, they set a course, but never asked the Lord's direction. They put their confidence in all the wrong things in men who die. And no doubt you'd be asking yourself, What's wrong with these guys? I mean, come on. We see it over and again in the Old Testament. Why couldn't they just rely on the Lord who has proved himself to them in their past? How could they be so foolish? How could they fail to see what had just happened to Samaria in the north? Now, putting aside that we see those same character traits in our own hearts at times, don't we? The same misplaced confidence, the same forgetfulness that leads us away from relying on the Lord as fervently as we should. So we, we really shouldn't point too many fingers at Israel and Judah without first examining our own hearts. Putting that aside though, understand what a great temptation this might have been for them in their circumstances. I mean, how, how they might have been tempted to justify their decision if they didn't keep their wits about them. I mean... Reality, rubber hits the road, Assyria is coming. And Egypt is ready and willing as an ally. So, doesn't all practical wisdom call for a political alliance born of necessity to take on the greater threat? You know, politics is a dirty business, but what choice was there, right? I mean, all their respective interests were aligned, Egypt and Judah. They both wanted national security. They both wanted to stop a common threat to the governance of the land. Why not partner together? Isn't that biblical wisdom? And hey, um, if Syria, Syria really is as bad as they appear to be, you know, cutting off noses and so on, which was their practice of their cap to their captors, if they're that bad, shouldn't we choose the lesser of the two evils? And after all, God wants us to do all things well. And the Egyptians, they're very efficient. They're very organized militarily. If anyone can win, it's them. They're the only ones that stand a chance here. This isn't a religious matter now. This is the real world. And maybe some of them even did what Christians today do. They, they kind of read their decisions into the Bible to validate them. Maybe they turn to Hosea, who was around the same time as Isaiah, and they said, hey, you'll never guess what I just read, uh, what, the God, what God said to me in my, my devotional time this morning. You know, I was in Hosea, Hosea 11 verse 1, and it said, out of Egypt I called my son. Isn't that amazing? God is, God, God is blessing our decision to turn to Egypt as a nation. Or still others might have said, you know, look, really, we must have a holistic view of the whole political landscape and focus on the bigger issues that Egypt can address for us. What options are there, really? Uh, we, we can sit and pray, we can wait for a miracle, or we can be pragmatic. We don't live in the realm of fantasy. God helps those who help themselves, and, and we can still trust Him while turning to Egypt. We'll pray about it while we'll sign on the hieroglyphic jotted line. And, and so on. And these are the sorts of thoughts, these are the emotions and temptations uh, that would be swirling around in them as they considered Egypt and its chariots. And the result is one of the great ironies of the Bible. Those who had been saved from Egypt by Jehovah now turn back to Egypt in defiance of Jehovah. 
the very nation that the Lord so utterly humbled with his mighty outstretched arm is the nation they run to and the skirts they want to hide behind. And notice why, why they were going to take this faithless course. Verse 1. Chariots, because they are many. Horsemen, because they are very strong. You know, that, that's what natural man always looks for and admires. Strength and numbers. Strength and numbers. Because in the world's eyes, strength and numbers are equated with success and wisdom. It's even why churches have to constantly fight off the temptation to be industrialized by business-minded individuals who think in terms of strength and numbers, who take worldly paradigms, corporate culture, systematize input-output flow diagrams to churn out the numbers instead of being a living organic body depending on the Spirit of Christ as it preaches the gospel of the Lord. But the workings of God in history have shown us repeatedly and categorically that human strength and human numbers have very little to do with faithfulness or success in the equations of heaven. And that He works quite differently from human expectation. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28. But no, said Judah, Egypt has the strength. Egypt has the numbers. They're the only logical choice. Let's go there. And so the Lord rebukes them. He says, verse 2, that disaster will come upon them from this quarter, not the salvation they foresee. He threatens to arise against the house of Judah for its misplaced trust, as he did against Israel, and against their helpers, Egypt. So, verse 3, Judah has a choice to make. Man of flesh, or God, who is spirit. If they choose to put their faith in man and horses... Both the helper and the helped will stumble and perish together. And eventually, by the way, Assyria would overrun Egypt in the decades that follows. So there's left hanging in the air the unspoken question, who are you going to trust? Because, verse 4, God's judgment upon his enemies is like a ferocious young lion. It's not going to back off its prey just because a gang of scrappy shepherds show up. Now, shepherds are a metaphor for rulers in the ancient world. The Lord isn't cowered by Egypt, nor by any nation or empire. But, verse 5, God's faithfulness will yet endure. He will not forget His covenants. Like a bird hovering, so the Lord shall watch and protect Judah in the midst of this titanic clash of nations and empires, Egypt and Assyria, smashing against one another with them in the middle. God will not forsake His promise to bring into the world a Savior through the line of Abraham. God will not forget His covenants. Though they are faithless, He will be faithful, He says, and show His grace to those He has kept for Himself, sparing them, rescuing them. And so he calls to them, verse 6. Even now at this late stage, he summons them to repentance. Do not turn to Egypt. Turn to him from whom you have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. Cast away the idols. And when that happens, see what the Lord can do. See how the Lord saves. And what we can all be relieved about is that while the northern kingdom never did this, it clung stubbornly to his idols. It was swept away. These words would eventually make an impact on the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, they woke up one morning. They saw in the news that the north was a heap of smoldering ruins. And in the years that followed, they saw coming the vast army of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And Jerusalem was besieged. And it was mocked. And it was reduced to utter despair. 
The enemy general, Rabshakeh, even shouted up at the walls, at the the defenders, Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all who trust in him. So all was lost for Jerusalem. All seemed forsaken. And then, when practically forced to it, Judah and King Hezekiah gave up their political alliances. They turned to the Lord. They cried out in prayer. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And the rest fled. And Jerusalem alone and all that region was never conquered. A fact that baffles historians to this day, but for which we have the answer in the Bible. And you can read about those events in Isaiah 36 and 37, but you can see it predicted here in the words of the prophet in verses 8 and 9. And the Assyrian shall fall by the sword, not of man. And of a sword, not of man, shall devour him. And he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert and the standard in panic, declares the Lord his fire is in Zion and his furnace is in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. The army was struck down by the angel of the Lord. They fled. Sennacherib died. And the nation of Assyria eventually gave way to nations that followed. So the victory would be seen to belong to the Lord. He preserved Judah. He had to reduce them to despair to break their idolatrous interest in Egypt. But then he saved them, and he won glory for himself. Not by human strength, not by numbers, not by horsemen, not by chariots, not by might, nor by power, but by his Spirit. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. And in case you're wondering, this isn't just a history lesson. It is a life lesson for believers, for Christians, for the followers of God. Be careful what you trust in. Be careful in your alliances. Beware the scourge of pragmatism upon the modern church. And seeing as today is Reformation Day, and tomorrow is Voting Day, and we hardly ever talk about that. I'm going to draw some application around this. How should Christians be voting? And immediately everyone's ears are pricked. What's the preacher going to say? Is he going political? Well, it depends what you mean. No, the pulpit is not the place to be endorsing political parties. Lest we fall prey to exactly the danger the Bible warns about. Trusting in human beings whoever they may be. Any political party can become an idol to those who trust in it and frequently does. Nor am I suggesting that Isaiah 31 is about voting. It's not about voting. It's about trust and choices and alliances. That's what it's about. And God's faithfulness and sovereignty to His Word. Nor is it the prerogative of the church to become the state. And we're not looking to create a new theocracy that has never worked well in the last 2,000 years that has been tried. Rather, our mandate as the church is to proclaim the gospel that saves sinners from hell. And true reformation and revival does not come about through politics, but by the Spirit of the living God. No, we're not going political. But if you mean, do elections and does voting fall in the scope of Christian decision-making, then the answer is yes, of course it does. Soli Deo Gloria, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, including voting in a democracy. This is not an area from which any Christian can suddenly disengage their biblical worldview and start to think like a pagan again. It's an area that must fall squarely within the light of Scripture, being informed and controlled by it. Now, I'm not attempting to say all that could or should be said in this very limited uh, time. I'm just reiterating the point that Isaiah made for us, namely that salvation is of the Lord, so be careful who you trust in. Be careful with whom you ally. 
strength, and numbers are not factors to be considered. God's will and God's glory is what must control us. You say, but Christians can't even see eye to eye on what, uh, what, what should be what in the voting booth. And that's true. It may interest you uh, that neither did the reformers see eye to eye on all these things. Like us, they had diverse opinions about what the state should look like, where authority lay, and those reformers sometimes changed or moderated their views as they grew older. And what, what a relief to know that they're like us, that they're imperfect, that they didn't get it right the first time, and they didn't get it right all the time. Uh, for instance, the, the early Baptists, the Anabaptists, they rejected all civil government, saying that it existed only to control unbelievers and that believers didn't need any control because we're quite capable of ruling ourselves. Then Martin Luther well, he said that the state ruled in everything but stopped at the foot of the pulpit. Then John Knox, in turn, advocated rebellion against the state if it was less than Christian or became tyrannical. Then John Calvin felt that there was a role for the church in the state while remaining separate, even as he denied the idea of the, right, the birthright of rulers and, and was quite happy to include some elections. Zwingli, meanwhile, felt that the state should rule practically everywhere because democracy tended to, de to, de to degenerate. He said, no man suffers himself to be held in check, and instead each one claims the power of the state as his own, and each one follows his own reckless desires. Hence there arise unrestrained conspiracies and factions, followed by bloodshed, plundering, injustice, and all other evils of treason and sedition. And it sounds a lot like what many Western democracies are facing today. He was practically prophetic on that point. But if the biggest names in the Reformation have such widely different views, we can probably expect a few different views on the church today. My burden is not to solve those mysteries. It's only to ask what we should do in the light of the present constitutional representative democracy in South Africa. Unlike most of the reformers and large parts of the world, we actually get a say in who leads us. So how should we use that voice in principle terms, not in specific? And the answer I suggest is one that we should all agree on. You should use that voice to the glory of God alone. It could hardly be otherwise, could it? You should use your voice, your vote, in a manner that would honor and please the Lord and Savior, because surely you could not use it in a manner that would displease Him. Assuming you vote. I'm not going into that whole debate. It's not an absolute biblical imperative, but it would certainly be helpful and beneficial to the church and for love of one's neighbor to do so. But the Christian must act in all things with a biblically informed conscience, not feelings or opinions or pragmatism. And therefore the Christian must vote with a biblically informed conscience, not feelings or opinions or pragmatism. The governing principle for all Christian living, whether you're at the shops or the voting booth, is God's will and God's glory always, so vote accordingly. And surely it can't be controversial to say that. And in South Africa, we can be thankful because while there is not one political party uh, in the land that is perfect, and we must never equate any given party with salvation, at least we don't have a one-party system like Red China or a winner-takes-all situation where your vote doesn't matter. So look at the parties that are out there, irrespective of their strength, irrespective of their numbers, and study what they stand for. They will they will tell you, and they'll probably do it with a lot, much more enthusiasm than you want to hear it. They will try and nail you down and sign you up and so on. But as you listen to them, please remember something that is frequently forgotten in democracies. Do not assume that spiritual or moral issues are unrelated to good or bad governance. Do not assume that the murder of millions of babies in their mother's womb in an ongoing genocide through abortion has nothing to do with state capture. Do not assume that a refusal to execute murderers through capital punishment while executing infants instead has nothing to do with corruption. Do not assume that state-sanctioned sexual immorality and attacks on marriage have nothing to do with mismanagement at a local municipal level. <laughs> 
do not assume that godlessness has nothing to do with service delivery. Someone says, well, what on earth do you mean? These things are separate issues entirely. They have nothing to do with each other. Really? Where in the Bible does it say that a nation's morality and its well-being are unrelated? Where in the Bible does it say that the sins of the people are unrelated to the quality of its rulers? Where does it say that land soaked in the blood of innocence will not produce a fearful response from the judge of all the earth, whatever that response, whatever form it might take? You can scour the Word of God to find all sorts of warnings in this regard. Romans 1, godlessness plainly leads to wickedness. Judges 9 speaks about the Lord stirring the leaders of Shechem to act wickedly and self-destructively, not because they had the wrong political ideology but because they, or because they didn't have the necessary business qualifications, but because they were spiritually and morally wicked. 2 Kings 24 mentions the self-destructive folly and decisions of Jehoiakim and says, Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord for the sins of Manasseh, which sins which Psalm 106 describes as they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted by blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds." You see, it wasn't only that they had bad leaders and therefore the, that the nation went bad. It's that the, the nation was bad and therefore God gave them bad leaders as a, as a punishment. Uh, that was a point that was well made by Andrew in his sermons on Kings Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim, one of whom was actually elected by the people, by the way. Again, stated more positively, Deuteronomy 19 says to Israel that they should purge the guilt of innocent blood, execute the murderer in other words, so that all may be well with you. Uh, they're faithful in this, the nation will prosper, he says. They're faithless in this, the nation will regress. In other words, get the biblical basics right, and the other things start to come right. Neglect the basics, turn to the wisdom of man, and society goes backwards, which is what is starting to happen increasingly in the post-Christian countries of this world, because they turn from the Lord who is spirit and trust in man who is flesh. But what this means, Christian brothers and sisters, is come election time, we are not to allow the world to frame the issues that should concern us and offer us nice, shiny chariots as solutions. Rather, we are to look at the biblical record and the biblical solutions, and we will see that God's concerns are frequently different from what we see placarded on all the lampposts on every corner of our city. That perhaps there are bigger issues than potholes to contend with. So as a Christian first and a South African second, examine what are the priorities of the political parties and see how closely they align with the Lord's revealed will. Keep it simple. Is the party I am voting for God-fearing while promoting righteousness, or are they godless and promoting wickedness? That's pretty simple. God-fearing and righteous, godless, promoting wickedness. Do the people I am electing to rule over this nation fear and acknowledge the living God who is jealous for his glory, or are they utterly indifferent to him, his will, his word, and his ways? And what sort of government ultimately can I expect from them based on their own godless or God-fearing manifesto? What sort of government will it be if it's headed by godless people who frequently flip-flop with the winds of change and fear of man? And what sort of government will it be if they rule in fear of God? Now, as the examples of the reformers show us, we may disagree along the way around issues of governance. But whatever your decision tomorrow, and if you're terribly offended by anything I've said, whatever your decision tomorrow, come back to this. Let it be a prayerful decision exhibiting faith in Christ and supremely concerned with His honor and His glory because you are to do all things to the glory of God alone. Surely we agree on that. 
Remember the lesson of Isaiah, which I'll summarize to you again. Not about voting. The lesson is be careful who you trust in. Be careful about whom you ally, or with whom you ally. Pragmatism through strength and numbers is not an indicator of success or wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You go wrong there, you go wrong everywhere. So remember God's will, remember God's glory, and go mark your X wherever you like. Wherever your conscience would put it. And like the reformers, and like the prophets and all the apostles, like Isaiah himself in the chapters that follow, even the next chapter, remember most of all that true hope for South Africa and all the nations of the earth is not by reform in the political realm, but by revival in individual hearts. As Charles Spurgeon said, Great schemes of socialism have been tried and found wanting. Let us look to regeneration by the Son of God, and we shall not look in vain. What does South Africa need most? It needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our problems are still spiritual in nature in this land. We have become a people and nation that does not trust God, that is not Christian, despite the ridiculous statistics which say that 70% of the population is. What? absolute nonsense we are a nation like others that is full of godlessness that leads to wickedness a nation of idolatry that does not seek the Lord despite claiming to do so every time we sing the national anthem and as Wingley made clear no democracy and therefore no political party no matter what it is deals with spiritual depravity in the heart deals with the turning of sin within so we're not to look to the West for the answers, overseas to the Western world, there's no help from that quarter. And we're not to look to the East, across the deserts and mountains, to Beijing's economic clout and ideologies, salvation is not from there. We're not to look to the North, to Pan-African interests, there's no deliverance there. We're not to be attracted to strength, nor to numbers, not to trust in men of flesh who die, but we look to the Lord who is spirit. We fall on our knees and we beseech Him to change the hearts of sinners that they might be saved. Our country needs to hear and obey the good news. The Son of God died on the cross and rose again. That He is the ruler of the kings of the earth and He is coming again in righteous judgment. But that any who repent of their sins and put their whole faith in Him and His work and His words will be forgiven and will live under His benevolent Lordship both in this life and into the ages to come. South Africa needs to confess the solas of the Reformation to God's glory by grace through faith in Christ. It needs to confess the words of Scripture alone. Psalm 20 verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let us pray. Our great God in highest heaven, it comforts us that we can look upon tomorrow without trembling, without uncertainty, but knowing that you are sovereign over all, that the outcome of tomorrow will be exactly what you have purposed. You will have your, earth, your will done upon earth as it is in heaven. And even though evil would seem at times to abound, that we can still be confident that yet our Lord is upon the throne. Lord, that in our responsibility as Christians and as Christian citizens, go with us. Help us. Help us to be wise. Help us to be, uh, to be, not, with, to be not to be ignorant in, on all the things that need considering. But Lord, help us more to be less concerned with politics and more concerned with your glory and the salvation of sinners. Help us, Father, to...
to speak less of the, the government, its problems, real or imagined, and more of, of your goodness and your purposes. Help us to open our mouths less about this or that political activity and more about Christ. And may the gospel be found readily upon our lips, full of wonder and praise to accompany it. These things we confess we are not always very good at. We confess, Lord, that we are easily distracted, that we are finite creatures, uh, enamored with our, 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 our own idols at times, and also with the business of the world. But help us, Father, to be preoccupied with the business of our King. We ask all these things, Lord, for we need your help. Please act to save sinners, we ask. 